former head of the CIA and the former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, Chris, number 13. Ability to be able to uh, place an explosive in technology that is very prevalent these days uh, and turn it into a war of terror, really, a war of terror. This is something new. Is it terrorism? I don't think there's any question that it's a form of terrorism. This has gone right into the supply chain, yeah. right into the supply chain. And when you have terror going into the supply chain, it makes people ask the question, what the hell is next? It sounds like you're genuinely worried. I am. I am. This is a tactic that has repercussions. And we really don't know what those repercussions are going to be. The forces of war are largely in control right now of what's going on. Do you think there should be condemnation for it? Should other nations step in, including us? I think it's going to be very important for the nations of the world to have a serious discussion about whether or not this isn't an area that everybody has to focus on because if they don't try to deal with it now, mark my word, it is the battlefield of the future. Do you share his fears? I think so. He's also saying something else by implication, and that is that you must measure what you may gain by what you may lose when you do something like this. And right now, uh, everyone in Israel, I, I think in the government at the top, is emoting. I don't think they're thinking. I think they're emoting. And that's why I use this term, a ruthless war of extermination. Anything that results in the loss of life of their enemies is judged to be good. There, there is no rational calculus. There, there is no end state uh, designed to harmonize interests. The only interest that is being taken seriously is Israel's interest in destroying its enemies. That's the only interest that counts. Everything else is irrelevant. And that leads you down a very dangerous path. Rachel Reeves stood up in the middle of her speech as she grimly churned through all the crimes that she was intending to commit against the working class people of Britain, stood up and wondered why we were still selling weapons to the mass murderer, one of the biggest mass murderers in history, Benjamin Netanyahu. He was seized around the throat, seized around the throat and frog marched out by the throat by labor functionaries, just like Nuremberg, just like the Gestapo labor dispatches, very roughly indeed of any critic who dares to raise their head. I presume that 19-year-old Daniel Riley will not be allowed back in to any labor event anywhere, and neither will there be any change of heart in the policy of the labor government to the absolutely unequivocal support that they have given and are still giving, despite all the blood, to the settler colonial regime they call Israel, even though it has moved its mass murder campaign from Gaza, although they're still mass murdering in Gaza. Of course, no day off for the poor refugees in the concentration camp of Gaza, but they have moved their killing fields to Lebanon. Lebanon, a sovereign country. Lebanon, a member of the United Nations. Lebanon, a country to which every other country in the world has diplomatic relations has ambassadors in place, is being remorselessly bombed with hundreds and hundreds of air attacks, killing hundreds and hundreds of people every day, most of them women and children. Was it ever thus? As I said the other night, put the letter H in front of any Arab child and you can slaughter them with impunity. Houthis, Hamas, Hezbollah, they all look the same. They all are deserving of death, violent, sudden death, delivered from American airplanes using American missiles and bombs with British airplanes supplying the targeting information 
and the offending uh, American and British reconnaissance flights flying out of somebody else's country, namely Cyprus and the British sovereign base there. This follows on the pager terrorist attack, which attacked in an instant thousands of people. None of them, notifiably at least, Hezbollah members. I know that many children were killed and maimed. I know one personally, a doctor in a hospital in Beirut, who has had his fingers blown off by a pager that blew up at the behest of Benjamin Netanyahu. People were blown up in taxis, in supermarket queues, at checkouts, in hospitals, in schools, in public transport, on buses and in taxis. They were not Hezbollah. They were innocent, ordinary civilians in Lebanon. And the truth is, the West is fully complicit in it. You could tell that by guesswork, but you can tell it even more acutely by the fact that not one single Western government has condemned this vile terrorist attack, the largest terrorist attack ever mounted in the world since 9-11-2001, and nobody has had jack to say about it. What's going to happen next? Well, it depends if this level of killing continues. If it does, it is bound to spark the wider regional war that the Democrats in particular, and they're telling the truth this time, really do not want five weeks before the American presidential election. Because this is all happening on their watch. It's all happening via their airplanes, their missiles, and their bombs. It's all happening via their total absence of any control or restraint on the violent attack dog that they have done so much to sharpen the teeth of. And Kamala Harris has got to win in Michigan. Kamala Harris has got to win in Wisconsin, got to win in Pennsylvania. At this point in time, I think it can safely be said that there is no chance at all of Harris being the victor in those three states. And as any fool knoweth, any Democrat that doesn't win those three states cannot possibly be elected president of the United States. So Netanyahu is batting for Donald Trump. There is no doubt about that. He is performing the maneuver first theorized, not first practiced, but first theorized by Richard Nixon. The mad theory. If you are completely mad and capable of doing anything, everything, it will be a psychological as well as a kinetic blow against them. Well, Netanyahu didn't have to do much to persuade us that he is mad. He's persuading the Harris administration, which, like any owner of a violent, dangerous attack dog, is in some trepidation as to whether to pull on the leash at all, let alone try to muzzle this salivating, snarling, killer dog. She can't do it. If she tried to, she'd have her own hand bitten off. All of which leads me to conclude that the presidency is Donald Trump's. Zion Don, they call him, with a hundred million dollars from Mrs. Adelson, the widow of the former Las Vegas casino owner, whose mission in life was to stuff dollars down the throats, in the pockets, everywhere they wanted it, of American politicians, has now stuffed an unprecedentedly large amount of dollars into the pockets of Donald Trump. One hundred million dollars. Fully a tenth of the entire campaign expenditure. And unlike the donors of Mrs. Starmer's underwear, she does want something in return. And what she wants is the undying loyalty of Zion Don in office to Benjamin Netanyahu. So Netanyahu has bet 
on a Trump victory. A wise decision, I must say. The American public, who are periodically invited to worry about foreign interference in their elections, are the biggest fools on the planet. The Israelis, their state and their lobby in the United States are not interfering in the American election. They are running the American election. They are picking the victors in the American presidential races and indeed down the ticket if they can possibly get away with it. Now, the collapse of the Eastern Front uh, uh, being uh, gamely defended, it must be said, bravely defended by Ukrainian troops, given that almost all of them are pressed men, swept off the streets of Ukrainian cities, dragged off in front of their parents, front of their wives and sweethearts, pressed into the front line with rudimentary training, have been bravely seeking to hold that line, but that line is now collapsing. I could give you an hourly update on the advances of the Russian forces. And the Ukrainian forces that were very foolishly pushed into the Kursk region of Russia in a kind of battle of the bulge effort are now surrounded. Thousands are dead. 5,000 of them are dead. Young men sent on a fool's errand for public relations purposes by a coke-sniffing crook in Kiev called Volodymyr Zelensky. What's going to happen next is difficult to see. There are reports this week that NATO are beginning to think about making a joint appeal for a settlement to the Russian president. The Russian president has given his answer in his adumbration today of the new Russian nuclear doctrine. Hitherto, any existential threat to the existence of the Russian Federation or Belarus would be met by a nuclear response. That's no longer the high bar that it once was. Significant aggression against Russian and Belarusian territory will unleash Russian nuclear weapons. So if these much talked about long-range NATO missiles begin to explode among civilian people in Russian cities and towns, there will be a nuclear response if Putin's new doctrine is to be believed. That should concentrate the mind wonderfully. I'm still powering my way through the book I talked about last week, the one which describes how Washington, D.C. would have 15 million people dead in minutes. In minutes, they would die from the shockwave, from the blast, from the heat, from the radiation sickness. And later, of course, those who survived it would die under the darkness of a nuclear winter. That's one missile on one city in minutes. If that doesn't concentrate your mind, then you are definitely not thinking straight. Like the electorates in those Western countries that are daily risking exactly such an outcome. If there was a full-scale nuclear war between Russia and the United States, based on non-classified data, the aftermath might go something like this. When one side launches nuclear missiles, the other side detects them and fires back before impact. U.S. submarine-launched ballistic missiles from west of Norway start striking Russia after about 10 minutes, and Russian ones from north of Canada start hitting the U.S. a few minutes later. The very first strikes are high-altitude EMP attacks, frying electronics and power grids by creating an electromagnetic pulse of tens of thousands of volts per meter. The next strikes target command and control, as well as nuclear launch facilities. Land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles take about half an hour to arrive. Major cities are targeted, both because they contain military facilities and to stymie the enemy's post-war recovery. Some cruise missiles take hours to reach their target. Each impact creates a fireball about as hot as the core of the sun 
followed by a radioactive mushroom cloud. These intense explosions vaporize people nearby and cause fires and blindness further away. The fireball expansion then causes a blast wave that damages buildings, crushing nearby ones. The United Kingdom and France have nuclear capabilities and are obliged by NATO's Article 5 to defend the U.S. So, Russia hits them too. Firestorms engulf many cities, where storm-level winds fan the flames, igniting anything that can burn, melting glass and some metals, and turning asphalt into flammable hot liquid. But the explosions, the electromagnetic pulse, and the radioactivity aren't the worst part. Nuclear winter is, caused by the black carbon smoke from the nuclear firestorms. The Hiroshima atomic bomb caused such a firestorm, but today's hydrogen bombs are much more powerful. A large city like Moscow, with almost 50 times more people, can create much more smoke. And a firestorm sends plumes of black smoke up into the stratosphere, far above any rain clouds that would otherwise wash out the smoke. This black smoke gets heated by sunlight, lofting it like a hot air balloon for up to a decade. High altitude jet streams are so fast that it takes only a few days for the smoke to spread across much of the northern hemisphere. In the meantime, Earth gets freezing cold even during the summer with farmland in Kansas cooling by about 20 degrees centigrade, or 40 degrees Fahrenheit, and other regions cooling almost twice as much. A recent scientific paper estimates that over 5 billion people could starve to death, including around 99% of those in the United States, Europe, Russia, and China. We obviously don't know how many people will survive a nuclear war. But if it's even remotely as bad as scientists think, then it has no winners, merely losers. It's easy to feel powerless, but the good news is that there is something you can do to help. Please share this video, because the more people know about nuclear war, the less likely it is that we'll start one.